the, the situation, I think, Sally, pretty much um, laid out for you, that we, while I was working at the university, David was a practicing architect, and we were in our mid-50s, and we were just thinking about what the next chapter was going to be in life, and we decided that we really wanted to have a plant nursery, and we lived in a, a, a decent-sized lot near the university, but not big enough for a, a, a nursery, certainly, although we did start it on our driveway there. You can't expand a whole lot on the driveway, and the neighbors don't <laughs> like it that much either. Um, so we bought this wonderful piece of property in, uh, in the hills, <clears throat> 21 acres. Gorgeous rolling uh, land, many different exposures. Um, we were just really delighted with it. It had no houses on it. It had no electricity to it, um, but that wasn't a problem. You know, we were thinking mostly in terms of the plants at that point. We did start um, running back and forth from our jobs to the land. Uh, we. We took our nursery plants out there, and then we also were doing things on the land, uh, building a pond, that pond right there, and uh, <laughs> we did talk about that in the book, and some other things. So we were running back and forth a lot, and realized that it, it, it was crazy trying to bring all of our tools and our fertilizers and everything out there and haul them back again, and it was just it was a big pain. So we bought a, um, a cheap, old, used, small uh, trailer as a storage place. And little did we know, as they say, <laughs> uh, how that uh, storage trailer would end up. S a few years after we bought the land, um, our son and family, he, he was a teacher in Southern Oregon, came to um, Eugene to go to the <coughs> university for a summer that's sort of regular training that teachers get. And we were all living together for a while and it got a little tight and we decided that it would be good to give them their privacy. And we could just shove aside the fertilizer and the tools and go spend the summer on the land, which we did. And basically we just fell in love with it. Um, and uh, we didn't move out there immediately. We went back to our sort of crazy lives, and uh, and the difference between our crazy lives and being out there were uh, was, was kind of immediately apparent, plus financial reasons that made it just make sense to rent out our house that was so near the university, good location, and we could get the taxes paid and the mortgage paid and all that that way, and we could, could move out there. Um, so that's sort of the situation in a nutshell. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with uh, some selections from summer. This is actually pre-summer and just about the time of year that um, we're having right now. While baby green new growth is still soft on the fir boughs and the solstice is a fortnight away, summer can arrive abruptly and with great wildness. A few days of rain and a couple weeks of humid warmth. Bingo, we're living in a jungle. The grass is head high. The mailbox disappears and I can't find the paths. I search for the sickle, but my blood races, exulting in the wild fecundity. The increased tempo and crescendo of song from the trees tell me the birds concur. One near summer day, I was cutting grass and weeds and stacking seed starter trays behind the trailer. When I came back around the corner, a big doe was munching happily on plants I had set out for the market. I suggested she graze elsewhere, and she bounded into the tangle that had once been our display garden. Then I saw her tiny spotted fawn inside the compound, protecting nursery pots, an area enclosed by six-foot-high chicken wire fencing. Incredulous that it could get in, I wondered how to get it out. I opened the gate, but of course that frightened the fawn further inside. It ran to the far end of the compound and started crashing into the woven wire, scattering pots this way and that. Mama Doe was on the other side of the fence, dashing crazily back and forth. I'd intended to scoot beyond the fawn to herd it back to the gate, but as it flipped pots and threw itself against the fence, I knew the solution had to be quicker than that. 
Moving as quietly as possible and talking softly to the terrified babe, I scooped it up. I remembered childhood stories, myths, but I didn't know that, of mother animals abandoning babies who had the smell of humans on them and was glad I was wearing gloves. The fawn screamed, <clears throat> more of a bleat, really. The doe wheeled frantically from side to side, eyes wide and wild. I lifted the fawn over the fence, mashing down the chicken wire, but not enough to get close to the ground. As the fawn leapt down, I said to the doe, here's your baby, mama, she's okay. When the fawn jumped from my hands, it doubtless felt as if it were escaping rather than that it had been rescued. Later, mom and babe were at the end of the drive and the doe watched me over her shoulder for a long time. If this had been a Disney film, we would have heard the strumming of harp strings and the doe would have batted her long lashes, whispering, thank you. <laughs> as much as I love summer nights, in the daytime the plants and I begin to sizzle starting around mid-July. When I used to water the research plants at the university greenhouse, I would grumble about the antiquated technology, and I swore never to drag hoses once I had my own business. Like so many pronouncements I have made, that one turned out to be a bit ironic. Compared to our initial method of pumping water into gallon jugs, I consider the gravity-fed hoses we now have to be state-of-the-art, and that's I, I talked about that in another place, but this is gravity-fed uh, water that's pumped from our pond into a big tank in the back of the, the pickup, and then you drive to a high point and, uh, and hitch up the hoses. <clears throat> and spending most of my summer hours moving slowly among the plants, holding the end of the hose, I not only see what's going on with them, who's about to bloom, who needs fertilizing or watering, who needs a bigger pot, but also get a front row seat for watching the wildlife. I need to be reminded why a house is a desirable goal, at least at night, at least in the summer, at least in the Pacific Northwest. One summer we turned our backs on the trailer and set up camp by the pond. David bought a tent, which initially disappointed me. I like to sleep under the stars. But the tent had a fine mesh roof that let me look out while giving him the enclosure he preferred. At night, I'd breathe in the sweet air and fill my head with the night sounds, haunting baritone hums and moans of the bullfrogs, excited yips of coyotes, repetitive toots of the pygmy owl, deep hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo of the great horned owl. Near the tent, we made a table of a piece of plywood over sawhorses, covering the table with pink and green plaid plastic tablecloth. On this, we put the camp stove, along with a stack of plastic shelving to hold, hold herbal tea, yogurt, cartons of muesli and rice, <coughs> dish soap, and a spoon. <coughs> Beneath and beside the table were enclosed boxes for plates, flatware, and kettles, olive and canola oil, tamari, salt, and peanut butter, and a cooler stocked with ice. Five pieces or so to the other side of the tent, the solar shower, a five-gallon plastic bag of water, black on its back to collect warmth from, from the sun, and equipped with attached hose and nozzle, hung from a fir branch. The rungs of a stepladder leaning against the tree provided shelves for soap, shampoo, David's razor, towels, and washcloths. A mirror fit snugly between the top of the ladder and the highest step. David hung a three-foot plastic pipe from another of the firs branches, and this became our closet rod. A clothesline between willows on the far side of the kitchen held wet towels and dishcloths. We luxuriated under our shower, watching birds doing somersaults in the air above the pond as we bathed. The chance to move about without bumping into each other was a more than welcome change. We ate looking out over the pond, with the water the color of French onion soup. Overwhelmed with our riches, I felt as if we were vacationing at an exotic resort.